Howdy folks, welcome to another episode of the Rifle Deer Channel. <clears throat> so two weeks ago, at a uh, thrift shop in Chilliwack, British Columbia, while we were on vacation, my wife found a novel. It was Star Trek The Motion Picture, the novel. And uh, it was a dollar. <laughs> I think it was published, it's the very first printing, I don't know if there's been more than one printing, but it was printed... Uh, in uh, 1979 and it was it was a fun book to read so I read it I'm going to tell you some stuff about it because I think certainly for me because I'm just I'm I've I've always been a little bit of a Star Trek nerd uh, I grew up with that stuff watching the original series the original cast and uh, you know I I love them all they're just you know the characters, not so much the actors, but I love the characters, what the characters are supposed to represent, and how they work together, and how they admired one another, um, sacrifice for one another. So, not so much necessarily the science fiction part, but the the interactions and the comradeship of the of the characters. So, I always felt that there was something missing from the original, you know, the the motion picture that came out at the end of the 70s. And I, I never really liked it that much until The Wrath of Khan. Then suddenly, whoa, okay, fantastic. But there's there's a three-year gap in between the original series after the Enterprise and the crew had finished their five-year mission. Then there's a three-year gap, and then the motion picture happens. And uh, in, in the movie, they, they talk a little bit about Okay, what had transpired over that three years, but really they, they totally left that part of, you know, the timeline in, in darkness. So the motion picture uh, book helps to fill some of those information gaps. And so I thought I'd make a video about it. I don't know if anybody else has made a video like this. They probably have. But uh, I'll make my own video. The hell with it. So Star Trek, the motion picture, the novel. And uh, maybe I should title this the uh, Filling in the Gaps. Star Trek, Filling in the Gaps. Whatever. So uh, the beginning of the movie starts off with um, three Katinga heavy cruisers of the Klingon Empire engaging this massive cloud formation. I'm not going to talk about what happens because you've watched the motion picture, right? If you haven't, if you haven't watched the motion picture, then this this video is not for you. <laughs> Sorry, or maybe it is. I I uh, I named my 1950 C number four Mark One Star Long Branch after a Klingon called Lursa. Her name was Lursa, a fem a female Klingon warrior. Anyway, Star Trek nerd. I just love that whole. Anyway. So anyways, you remember that, that, that scene where the Katinga uh, heavy cruisers are heading towards the... And they turn green and they, they di disappear and all that different stuff. But there's this whole story around that in and of itself. And, uh, and how that transpired. Anyway, so here's the thing. Is it Kirk? He's in northern Africa. And uh, he's in the city of Alexandria. And it turns out he's a huge history nerd. So he's there with these these scholars, Libyan and uh, Egyptian scholars, and he's studying uh, studying ancient Earth history with these scholars. And suddenly he starts to get these images appear in his in his head. He's sitting there. He's got his. He's looking at a book. He's he's thinking about something, and suddenly these ghostly images of this Katinga heavy cruiser engaging this cloud just suddenly erupts into his mind like it's a, an old memory. Well. The thing is, is uh, Star Trek, Starfleet commanders had what was called a Senseiver brain implant, a little device that was uh, only went to senior um, officers, uh, captain and higher up to the, your, your flag officers and so on, admirals, is that uh, they had the Senseiver, and what it could do is, um, is transmit scenes or kind of moving imagery and and you would it would seem like you were reliving a memory okay so Kirk is in this is a, is in Alexandria in Egypt and he's having this thing happen you know, 
the, the other scholars, he's kind of behaving strangely. The other scholars are looking at him wondering, okay, that's odd behavior out of uh, Admiral Kirk at the time. So they sent him the, uh, the moving imagery of the Klingon Katinga class heavy cruisers engaging in the cloud, the invader. And uh, uh, all of this, it turns out, all of this imagery was was recorded by a warp-capable drone that had been launched by Epsilon-9 Outpost, which is on the edge of Klingon space. So they they sent this warp-capable drone towards this cloud, which they had in long-range sensors that the, uh, the Klingons were engaging, and they recorded the whole event. And they, uh, when so they, they sent this, some of the basics of this imagery to Kirk through the Sensiver implant. So what he does is he flies all the way after receiving this this message. He knew he knew he knew what it represented, right? It's an emergency signal, and the only time that the send receiver is engaged is when it is an emergency of significant scope and magnitude, which means we need you now. Why they didn't use other mechanisms to contact him, I don't know. But that's how they did it. And so he he gets in a shuttle and he and he he flies over to Gibraltar. Which, as you know, between Morocco and Gibraltar, there's a there's a very thin land area, land bridge there, from to, to access from the Mediterranean into the Atlantic. Well, that many many years ago had been turned into a hydroelectric dam, so it was bridged. There was no need to send in naval vessels in and out. That was like a you know an old technology that would never be used before. Again, so. He goes to Gibraltar because that's where the nearest telecommunications uh, station is and he has to go through all the security, retina scans and all that different stuff. And then um, he, uh, he communicates with uh, a flag officer that's there. And her name is... What is her name again? Lori Sienna. She's, a, she's an admiral. And Kirk and Lori Sienna had a personal romantic relationship. It's Captain Kirk, right? Anyway, uh, they briefly speak about the Sensiver communication. He was expecting to to see Nagura, Admiral Nagura there, so he was surprised that it was the other Admiral, because it's, it's that kind of importance. Um, he's, a, he's an Admiral himself, so he has access to that small group of people, very powerful uh, Starfleet officers. And, uh, but he was greeted by Admiral Lori Siena. And Lori had him watch the, uh, the scene again in its, in its entirety. And it was a fully three-dimensional hologram that he was inside of, almost like he was, that's where the communication station is. Okay, he, he goes into it, and he has basically um, a full 3D hologram capability in this room. It's built as a communication that's able to transmit a fully three-dimensional interactive video, which they're not capable of, of emulating in the original motion picture, right? But that's kind of where the, 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 uh, the writers for this, this movie were, that's where their heads were. That's where they were saying the technology of the day would be. And so he's able to zoom in, look at the Katinga birds and all this, you know, the um, heavy cruisers and the cloud uh, in a fully 3D environment. And uh, so referring to the intruder as the cloud invader, turns out this, this huge giant cloud, this massive um, invader was traveling at warp 7 towards Earth. Like, like the, the movie didn't really kind of communicate that to me that I can recall, you know, from thinking way back in space and time from when I originally saw it, but I didn't know that they were traveling as fast as Warp 7, but I, be, I guess they would have to be traveling that fast in order to close the distance that they did in such a short time. Um, so basically what the, the Admiral tells Kirk is that there are no experienced officers between us and that cloud formation which is coming at us at that high velocity. And it will literally be here in days. There are no operational ships that close. They're all off on, on you know, significant away missions. And uh, 
this invader came out of nowhere. So he manages to use the situation to get himself back into a command role, in an operational command role. So this is, this is where um, a lot of this kind of insight comes in to the novel. Because uh, Kirk has been, at, at this point in time, in the, in the Star Trek time scale, Kirk is a very unhappy camper. Sure, he's been promoted to Admiral. You'd think he'd be happy about that, but he's totally not. He's very unhappy. And upon his return from the Enterprise's famous five-year mission, he accepts uh, promotion. And it's because of his promotion that Dr. McCoy resigns his commission as a Starfleet surgeon. Now, why would he do that? You would think that McCoy would be happy for Kirk, right? You would think that McCoy would be happy for Kirk because he's going to be an admiral now, right? like his career path. However, uh, um, when he returns from his five-year mission, Captain Kirk is groomed for promotion by Admiral Nagura. And McCoy campaigns against this. McCoy goes so far as to lead a team of physicians with medical evidence that, that kind of, with that, with medical evidence that promoting Kirk to admiral would eventually destroy him. The wrong job for a personality like Captain Kirk. He told Nagura, "If you put that man behind a desk, you'll kill him." And uh, McCoy frantically tries to convince Kirk not to accept promotion, but he fails. And upon Kirk's promotion to flag officer, he's now Admiral Kirk, Leonard McCoy resigns in disgust and turns his back on Starfleet Command. He pursues a career in advanced medical science. So that's, that's a little piece I didn't know about, right? That's like a huge, huge thing that occurs within the, you know, the return from the five-year mission and the three years later, the motion picture, right? So in that time, the USS Enterprise has been totally torn apart and completely rebuilt. Now, Kirk assigned the reconstruction of the Enterprise to a bright young officer called Captain Decker. And um, this is an officer that Kirk especially likes. He's charismatic and he's intelligent. And he's, he's not the sarcastic officer that, that, is, that is portrayed in the movie. You know that kind of sarcastic tone that the particular actor that portrayed Decker used in the movie, right? I didn't like that. I, uh, like as soon as I saw that, I knew I didn't like that character. Same kind of a whiny, sarcastic, kind of backstabber. It's kind of the way I kind of felt his character was portrayed. Well, that's not who his character was. So the, the director and the producers, they use some artistic flair there. Okay, but that's not who he was. Uh, Captain Decker was a was a straight shooter and he didn't hold grudges. He was a total professional. So Kirk liked him. He said, I'm I'm giving you my ship. That's a huge honor. Fix her up for the for the uh, for the, the the modification and the upgrade and once it's done, you're in charge. You're you're the new captain. So he liked Decker. Now Kirk at this point in time, he was totally miserable. Um, he had come to appreciate what McCoy was trying to tell him. He just he's, he, he he criticizes himself quite a bit for making those kinds of mistakes. Um, but additionally, he knows that he had been used by Admiral Nagura for political reasons, and uh, that kind of put a little bit of a sour taste in his mouth as well. Something he's been having to digest for the last three years. He was manipulated and he was used for his fame and shoved behind a desk, just like what McCoy said would happen. Now, Admiral Nagura, we're talking about the head cheese in charge of Starfleet Town. And uh, he's almost a political character. So the reason why Nagura needed Kirk uh, was because Starfleet wasn't very popular with humans on Earth. And Starfleet had incurred loss after loss and was not doing well. The war with the Klingons had taken a heavy toll and uh, the opinion was that Starfleet just simply was not well led. And Nagir is at the top and he's essentially in many ways having his ass handed to him and 
and by the Klingons. So it, it, it looks bad on him. Defeat after defeat, heavy loss after loss. Some victories, but you know, it was not, these were not uh, convincing military battles in space with the Klingons. So Admiral Nagura finally had a success story and it was to be told by Starfleet's newest hero, Admiral James Tiberius Kirk. And Kirk would bring resiliency and believability back to Starfleet Command. He would restore confidence back with the Admiralty for political reasons. Nagura needed to chain him to a desk as a public figure. To achieve this, he lied to Kirk and promised, an op promised him operational roles that just never transpired. Three years goes by. And uh, Kirk eventually came to understand this by studying the trends and patterns of his of service of his service as an admiral over the last three years. I mean, he is a historian after all, right? He's, he is a student of, of history. So, he, uh, he speaks to this admiral, Lori, Sienna, and uh, negotiates a meeting with him and Nagura personally. And so, um, the intention of his call with Lori, though, was simply for him to, to share his opinion on what to do about this cloud invader coming into, into space, heading directly for Earth. And Kirk refused to divulge his opinion. He had to have that meeting with Nagura personally. So, um, he gets his meeting. So he jumps on a shuttle and he travels to Starfleet Command Headquarters to speak with Nagura himself. Now the cloud, or the, the intruder, the invader, um, is traveling towards Earth at warp 7. Again, the Earth has no experienced commanders or ships able to accept it in time. And while Decker is a fine officer, um, he does not have the experience dealing with the unknowns like this, of this scope and magnitude. Kirk does. He's one of the only captains to return after a five-year mission. But he's, he's been elevated in rank, so he's not supposed to be doing that job anymore. So Kirk meets with Nagura, and uh, Kirk negotiates a deal to get the Enterprise back, which is almost completing its three-year uh, upgrade. Now, when he comes into the meeting, the book basically describes that Kirk is prepared to resign over it if it doesn't go his way. And uh, one of Kirk's conditions is that Nagura drafts Leonard McCoy back into service to serve on the Enterprise. Right? He's, accept he's accepting a grade reduction in rank to captain in order to get the Enterprise back. Nagura folds and gives him the Enterprise back. So he basically beams straight from Starfleet headquarters with his, or with his new orders and uh, realizes that uh, the Enterprise is in total chaos. It's not spaceworthy yet. Now, I think they effectively communicated that in the movie. Between the untested technology, the new engines, the new, uh, the new systems, and the, uh, and the crew, which was quickly formed aboard the Enterprise, um, with the Enterprise in that condition, they're essentially thrust into action. Uh, Captain Decker is replaced by Kirk, who isn't familiar with the new ship's design. Kirk doesn't even know which turbo ship gets him to the bridge. Like, he's lost on that ship. It's not the same ship. It's a totally new ship. Right? And then the incident with the transporter happens. Um, and that results in the horrible deaths of Commander Sonak, which, is, which was going to be the Vulcan science officer aboard the Enterprise, and Admiral Lori Sienna, his old love, which we didn't really know in the movie. I mean, they're twisted, deformed bodies, basically were turned inside out during that transporter incident, and he watched it happen, right? And it was it was a horrible thing to behold. They just the just the having to deal with with that. There's an omen on that ship, and it shrouds the entire crew. So many of the crew feel that this is a, this has turned into a total and complete suicide mission. Everything is, count, is stacked against them. 
So now is kind of where we're the stage of the book where it really identifies the power of the chief medical officer. So McCoy arrives on the Enterprise and he's very, very angry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, McCoy discovers that it was Kirk that had him drafted. So when he comes aboard that ship, after what happened, you know, the reason why he resigned from Starfleet in the first place was because Kirk was, has been elevated to Admiral. And uh, then he's drafted back into, into service. And he communicates to Kirk in no uncertain terms of his dissatisfaction of the situation. And, um, but he accepts the situation and he shakes Kirk's hand. He just accepts it. You know, if it was any other, if it was any other man, he would. Anyway, we don't know for sure. So McCoy immediately goes to sick bay and has a conversation with Nurse Chapel, who is actually the MD. She's, she's now an MD. She's a fully fledged doctor, highly skilled, highly trained um, physician. And uh, because McCoy has been brought back, she's, again, a grave reduction in rank, and, and she's, she's back to being the nurse, even though she's a fully-fledged doctor. Um, as the chief medical officer for the Enterprise. So they have a confidential discussion, and it is regarding James Tiberius Kirk. Now the new Starfleet uniform, kind of the one they only used for the original motion picture that got this great big huge giant belt buckle looking device right in the middle of the abdomen. Well, it turns out that uh, that is a transceiver that communicates all physiological medical information to the ship's medical computer. I mean, the, the, uh, the computer is monitoring your, your, your bio readings at all times on board the ship, while you're on board the ship. And uh, Chapel has been watching Kirk's bio readings very closely, and, and she's able to give McCoy a complete situation report on his, uh, like a detailed medical report. Now, it's only information from, from the last 15 hours since Kirk has been aboard the Enterprise, but um, there we go. The data shows indications of strong emotional stress. She communicates to McCoy. Chapel also indicates, or continues by her own analysis of the uh, of the data as it applies to Kirk, and she advises McCoy that Kirk's physiological profile matches those of someone going through narcotic withdrawal. Narcotic withdrawal, and that makes McCoy's eyebrows lift significantly. Um, and and he agrees, a total absence of starship command, which is so badly desired by Kirk, and. That is over the last three years, and it has become an obsession. It's a total obsession for him to get Starship Command back. He was, you know, being away from that has been like narcotic withdrawal for him. So it's an obsession. McCoy agrees with Nurse Chapel. In fact, that was his prognosis before even stepping into the room. For her to to uh, to confirm that is 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 right. And so McCoy decides to watch Kirk very closely and decides eventually that Kirk requires an intervention. Now this is not really that well demonstrated in in the movie. The, the, the book makes it very clear. And so here's, here's a quote from the book. Jim, this has turned into an obsession that can blind you to far more immediate and critical responsibilities. The, your need to command the Enterprise. So McCoy is arguably the most powerful officer on board the Enterprise. Kirk knows this. He has the power to remove Kirk from his command authority if the doctor decides he is not medically fit. So when McCoy speaks, it is obviously in Kirk's best interest to pay attention to his professional opinion. Now, that's where I'm going to leave it. Okay, Kirk has basically been given a notice by the doctor um, that if you step out of line, I'm pulling you. And he means it. So, that's where I'm going to leave you with the book. I, 
I recommend you go down to your local thrift shop, find a copy of it and read it. You might just enjoy it like I did. Hope you're all doing well, folks. Cheers, and as always, Maple Leaf up.